Last time, Tony from Tony's Mopar Parts flew out to the graveyard to check in on the restoration progress on his 1970 Challenger RT, only to be given the runaround while cousin Dougie raced against the clock to disassemble. With Tony back home and SEMA fast approaching, the ghouls hustle to get Chris Jacobs' 1968 GTX and John Buck's 1971 Challenger completed in time for the big event. But Mark is about to receive some bad news. Just a black eye for graveyard cars. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried dead, 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 dead are coming back to life. I'm Mark Warman, and together we bring dead muscle cars back to life. To exactly the way they were on the day they were born. I'm getting ready to do the spot welds on the trunk on John Buck's car. Uh, hopefully everything goes good. I mean, I cleaned the metal, I prepped it. What more can I ask for? As long as the spot welder does what it should do, it should go good. John is a great client of ours. We've got several cars for him. We have had over the years. The first one we did for him was the 1971 Challenger RT factory formal roof car. We were a little late getting John's car done because we had to put it on the back burner to get our 71 Cuda down to the SEMA show for Mopar. Now John was in on all that. He knew the reason his car got back burned. While he was down there, as soon as the car was unveiled, John fell in love. And sure enough, you know, he ended up coming up to me and saying, I want an identical twin to my car, the 71, but I want it to be Hellcat powered. His car's going great. George has been doing a good job on it. The rest of the pieces Dave been rounding up. So I think we're gonna be out of the woods on that one. Chris Jacobs, that's an extra monkey in the wrench, as John McClain would say, uh, die hard. That car's gonna be a little bit tougher because I think we only have like 30 or 60 days to get it done. But that's getting the 392, so it's gonna be a little simpler since we've just done that on our 71 Cuda. But all in all, we got a shop full of cars and we are heading to SEMA with dos cool cars. So I've been working on John Buck's car, trying to get it ready for SEMA. I got my metal in, everything's went kind of smooth, but I mean, there's so many things to go over. It's all just adding up and taking extra time. I mean, honestly, there's no way I'm finishing this car. I just, I'm really having a hard time. Um, I mean, the car's going good for what it is, but with the deadline, the time, I, I just... Because we actually got to call a co an owner of this car and tell him his car's not going to be done. Then we have to call Mopar and let them know we're not going to be able to keep our promise with them. Like, why isn't everybody else helping on it? There was maybe 80 or 90 hours worth of metal work, and, and here we are. So that's the problem. If people don't have any kind of a sense of urgency and they don't feel like it matters, then it doesn't matter. And if it doesn't matter to you or to Adam or Will or Alyssa or the rest of the team, if it doesn't, then it's like, what are we doing it for, right? Right. Right? It's just a black eye for graveyard cars, that's all. Is what it is. It's disappointing, it's upsetting, it's frustrating, it's all those things because, I mean, so many people count on this kind of thing, right? I mean, we make our promises that we'll do it and, and I really felt like, I honestly legitimately felt like we could make it happen. It's very maddening and it's very frustrating and, you know, but I'm not, you know, 10 years ago I would have been throwing things and right now it's just, I've got to go make some embarrassing phone calls. Hey, Bill Mark. How are you? Bill out at Mopar, uh, he's my connection. It's one we worked with uh, last year in order to get the 71 Cuda to the SEMA show. Hey, so um, if you got just a second, here's our situation. Pretty good chance, maybe more likely than not, that we won't be able to get the car there. Hey, all right, hang on a second here. Well, give me just a second, okay. So it turns out they've already gone to publication with their newsletter. They've already blocked out all these time slots for that particular car to be there. No, I wasn't saying we wouldn't be there with a car. I was saying I didn't think we would make it with the Challenger. Well, I don't, I don't, 
Well, that's what I'm doing as I'm figuring that out right now. So, so I was thinking if I could pluck one of the cars out of the lineup that are a lot closer to the finish line, even if it's temporarily put the Hellcat in, at least we can get down there to the show. Sorry if I startled you, that wasn't the point. Yeah. Okay, buddy. Bye-bye. I just have to go out and I have to find a car that's going to fit. Then after I find the car that it could fit and everything could work and the timing and everything's right, I still got to call the owner of that car and make sure they're okay with us doing this. So wish me luck. So I'm looking through the cars that are actually painted. But it's not just finding one that's painted or ready to go together. It's also the fact that, like this, the 69 GTX is a beautiful car. It's also a numbers matching car. You don't pull a numbers matching drivetrain out. I mean, I don't care. Who asks me? All right. 71 Cuda. Okay, I got I got one here. Think about it. Oh god. Hey buddy. Don't start with all that stuff. Well just <clears throat> I was supposed to remind you yesterday about putting your order in through Phoenix Graphics. Well you're supposed to remind me yesterday, why are you reminding me? Today? It's better than not at all. Okay. And it was oh, okay, 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 okay. I got it. I'm with you. So, 70 Challenger. What else? Uh, we have the Superbird. Okay. Eh. Alice! Mary! Yep. Cindy! Hey, Will? Yeah, hey! Yeah, a second, buddy. What's up? What's Dave got left on that thing? Oh, we've got the nose cone and then a few interior Ryan's pieces. Ryan's gonna help him put that on? Yeah. So it's pretty much wrapped up. You know, is he expecting that in like two or three weeks? Mm -hmm. Alrighty, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the idea. What idea? Yeah. Yeah. Glad I could help. Super pretty. It's a non-numbers anything. That's the car. There's nobody on the planet has ever done one of these in the first place with a Hellcat crate engine in one, and they certainly haven't done one in a wing car. I'm glad I thought of that. Superbird. Will, go round up Davey. <laughs> so that's really good news. I just talked to Dave and I talked to Will, talked to Alyssa. I got everybody's input and feedback on doing a Superbird. So all I have left is I gotta call the owner of the Superbird, get his buy-in on it. Sir, the stars are shining on you today. I'm not gonna call them up and say, oh, I'm really in big trouble, can you help me out? Cause then they feel like they have one on you. I'm gonna tell them I'm gonna do them a favor. How would you like me to remove the 440 plus six, six barrel and the four speed out of the Superbird, bear with me, and install a 707 horsepower Hellcat crate engine with a six speed Tremec transmission at no extra charge to you. No, 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 I just, uh, you were the first person I thought of when they offered the engine that uh, I would want to make happy with this. So, you know, you deserve that. You're a good guy. You're in. Good. Who's the dream maker? Dream maker. We are green light for Hellcat, Superbird, SEMA, rock on. You guys cut when I'm doing this because it looks like I'm flying out of set. Don't hang on it too long because. Mark just informed me that our 70 Superbird tribute car, which is a 446 barrel, is now gonna be called the Hellbird, which is in sense is gonna be our 70 Superbird tribute car with a Hellcat engine in it. Dave just stopped me on the way by to check in on the Superbird and give him a hand set in the back window. And I think we're going to have to go backwards before we go forward shortly, right? Yeah, we are. The 446 barrel and the four speed that's so painstakingly put in there is all going to come back out yep. and make room for the bad boy. Yeah, which is going to be awesome. But we got to get past this first, so we're going to set the back window in it, and then he can finish wrapping up the rest of the interior, and we'll start working on the rest of the disassembly of the car. Sweet. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. So before we set the back glass, I just wanted to show you um, these are the reveal molding clips. The reveal molding that pops on that puts the trim around between the vinyl top and the glass. It's called a back glass reveal molding. They're held in place with these little clips. Now normally, originally, this was steel. 
Exactly. But this is the Ted Janik reproduction, so it's made of fiberglass. So Dave took it upon himself to think that out a little bit and realized that if it was just screws, they could possibly work their way back out over the years with vibration. So what he did was underneath there, the screw that holds this in place, you put panel bond yeah, adhesive on it. Yeah, that's what you recommend yeah. using. Yeah, and so. it's, it's gonna lock that mother up tight as a drum, so I just feel bad for the guy trying to get him back out next time. Exactly. So, ready? Right, boss. Yes, okay. sir. And that's how we put a back window in. You're welcome. All right. Stay tuned. Our tribute Superbird gets its drivetrain removed in preparation for the epic plug and play Hellcat. Ron Jenkins arrives with a plethora of accessories to not only make our Superbird a Hellbird, but to breathe new life into Chris Jacobs' 1968 GTX, getting equipped with its own 392 Hemi crate engine. With less than a month away, the only question is, will they make it in time? A few weeks ago, Chris's car came in. Uh, we got the drivetrain taken out of it. We bring it over here, uh, you kind of assess the damage, and we were hoping we could do some, kind of some quick repairs. But since it was a fire, it kind of just blistered the paint everywhere. So it was just safest to make sure that it was a good quality job that I just stripped the whole thing down to bare metal. Once that's done, you go back through it, got a nice coat of primer on it. Uh, then once that dries, I'm gonna sand it out, get the black on it for Mike to come in and do his graphics. Mike just showed up. Uh, we got the car in the booth ready for him just to go to work on it. So we took him in there. He kind of did an overview of what he's gonna do with the little Phoenix. Uh, everything looks good and he's ready to get going. Uh, Mike Laval is one of the top airbrushers in the world, so him and Chris have built a very good relationship. So when it came time to doing this project, he wanted him to come in and do his artwork on it. Uh, now that he's got all of his part done, I'm going to jump in there. I'm going to clear coat the engine compartment, clear coat the hood, and then it's done and ready to go back over today for assembly. This is something we don't normally do. I'm actually going to start disassembling uh, the drivetrain and suspension on our uh, 1970 Superbird tribute car in preparation for a Hellcat engine. So super excited about putting a Hellcat engine in this Superbird. It's gonna be the talk of SEMA, I guarantee you. I mean, this car is gonna be amazing. Six speed manual transmission, Dana 60 rear axle. It's gonna be an amazing car. But to get to that point, right now we got a 446 barrel in there with a four speed manual. So I actually gotta take out the 446 barrel and uh, the four-speed manual transmission and then get it all prepared uh, for that amazing Hellcat engine. So that's what I'm in the process of doing now. I gotta take out the radiator, of course, the shroud, uh, unhook all the hoses, unhook all the wiring and the plumbing, and then we'll work underneath of the car. So super excited. What I'm gonna end up doing is on this particular build is I'm gonna trunk mount the battery on this. Because on our Hellcat engine, our air box is gonna come down like right here and our air filter is gonna be sitting right here. So I wanna remove this battery tray and by trunk mounting it, I won't have any obstructions in the engine compartment. It'll look nice and clean. We'll end up putting this engine in another car, which should be cool because it's all built out and ready to rock and roll. So then once I get all this here unbolted out of the top end here, then I'll push the car back and get it up on the lift and start prepping out the bottom. Then our man Ron should be showing up here. Uh, Ron from Magnum Force is actually going to help us with the suspension on our Superbird as well as Chris Jacobs' car. It makes it so much easier to have him, you know, helping us because he's really experienced in these engine transformations and of course it's his design and suspension. So who would you want better than Ron to actually help you put the engine on there? As I'm removing the radiator, I know I got to move on to the the upper control arms as well as all the other rest of the suspension. Then I started thinking about it, looking at that engine apartment, I'm trying to picture a Hellcat engine in there, and it sounds really cool. But then you start thinking of the reality of it, of we gotta put a Hellcat engine in here. It's not like a 392 that we've already done, which is really easy, just a Hellcat engine. You start thinking, I don't know if this is gonna work, but so it's, it's reality check time. Uh, as far as the Hellcat and 392 go, the only difference that I know is one's supercharged and one's not. So I know you got those extra components like the supercharger, you know, the extra belt, 
you know, and stuff like that. So as far as the engine goes, the wiring goes, I mean, Mopar's awesome. Their, their wiring and everything works plug and play pretty simple. But then I start thinking, what's different from that Hellcat engine than that 392 Hemi? And realize it's going to be a little bit more difficult than I anticipated. Pretty much got all the firewall unplugged, all the wiring harness, all the hoses. And uh, so we're pretty much ready to go underneath of the car and start working on the undercarriage, which is just primarily transmission cross member, Z bar, you know, drive shaft, of course, and then the K member, upper control arms, and then out she's going to come. Uh, the owner, I'd be super stoked. I mean, for one, I mean, who has a Superbird with a 707 horsepower Hellcat? I mean, you just try to wrap your head around that. 707 horsepower. I mean, it's just an insane amount of power. I mean, thank goodness it's actually going into a wing car because you're probably going to need that wing to keep the ass of that car on the ground. I mean, it, it's, it's insane. It's crazy. In 1970, on a Plymouth Barracuda, we know that if the second digit of the VIN was an S, like for special, it meant it was the performance model. It was the Cuda, no longer the Barracuda. Which of these options was not standard on a Cuda model? Was it hood pin tie downs, road lamps, rally instrument cluster? Think you know the answer? Stay tuned after the break, you'll find out. So what did you think, folks? What'd you come up with? 1970 CUDA, what was not standard on it? If you answered the rally instrument cluster, you're correct. The rally instrument cluster was an option still on the CUDA models, where the road lamps, those came standard. If you had an S in the second character of your VIN, you got those, you got the hood pin tie downs, along with some other really cool options. Now, what's interesting about that is you go over to the Challenger, and all Challenger RTs, which would be arguably the sister to the CUDA, did come standard with the A62 Rally Instrument Cluster, which by the way featured the famous 8,000 RPM tachometer. Instead of the phrase, the Eagle has landed, the Hell Crate has landed. The crate engines just showed up from Mopar. We got our 392, we got our Hell Crate. We got to move them over to the engine room, get them up onto stand so we can start working on them. There's some conversions, oil pan things that have to happen. We're going to get ready for that. All right, let's lift this mother humper off of there. Oh, look at that. Ha <laughs> ha! Wrap that thing off of there. Let's see what we got. Wow, look at that clutch. Son of a. Oh my goodness. Look at those factory headers. Jeez. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Pretty damn cool. So typically speaking, what we do is use the shop crane, lift the engine up off of the stand, or off of the crate, put it on our engine stand, and we'd be in, in good shape. The problem is there's no lifting points on this Hellcat engine. So we used our forklift to come in, lift it up in the air, but now to be able to put it onto the actual engine stand itself so we can do the modifications to it, we have to take the clutch pressure crate and flywheel off the car. So that's what Doug's doing now is getting those things off so we can mount it onto the engine stand, then we can roll it over and get started on the conversion work we have to do. Okay, now we're gonna come in here, guys, and we're gonna start zapping these mother humpers out. Oh my gosh, it's pretty light, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty cool, man. We're used to these it's old tanks, cool. man. Look at this, it's all hogged out in the backside. That's beautiful. It is. Having done the 392 in our 71 Cuda, but not having done the Hellcat, I'm not exactly sure of everything. I would suspect the basic footprint is the same, but I know that the Hellcat is supercharged. So there's gonna be things like the, the supercharger plumbing and the cooling that go with that, plus probably different exhausts. I mean, I'm sure that there's a difference between that original 450 horse or so up to the 707 horsepower. I have no doubt that they made some changes. I just hope there's not so many different things that it either makes it impossible to install or slows us down to a point where we can't make our deadline. Oh, nice. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. We got Ron Jenkins coming up from uh, Magnum Force. He's gonna give us a hand putting the changeover pieces on this. Uh, we gotta change out the oil pan, the pickup tube, uh, the dipstick, I think the oil filter, relocation of the, uh, the oil pump, I think that also has to happen. So when he gets here, we'll do that, then we'll put it together on the uh, Magnaforce suspension, and we'll put it in the Superbird. And we'll hit the key and see if it starts. 
707 horsepower of fire-breathing night. There's no doubt that everything is going great. I'm optimistic that we will meet our deadlines, at least I'm hoping so. But you know, it's my job as an owner is always a little bit different because while the rest of the guys are celebrating and getting ready to go to the big show where they roll out the carpet and treat everybody like celebrities, which is ridiculous, I still have John Buck sitting in the back of my mind thinking, man, I gotta make the call. I gotta disappoint this guy again. And I don't wanna damage that relationship. But the fact of the matter is we're where we're at right now. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, so I've gotta make the call. Uh, since Chris burned the car to the ground, we just had a little uh, engine compartment work to do. We put a new hood on it, lowered the hood down, painted it black, and we do that in a complete single stage. So once that's dry and fully cured, I go back over it, mask off the black, and then I lay out the flat black. So it's kind of having to do it in two different stages, that way we can get the glossy and the full. So I'm underneath the car. I got pretty much all the drivetrain unbolted and everything else, I'm lifting the car up off the suspension. Oh man, it's, it's starting to really settle in of how troublesome. I mean, look at the timeline, three weeks. You got three weeks to put this engine in there. I just can't wrap my head around that. I just don't think that that's gonna happen. Here we got a completely painted car. I got carpet in it. I got everything else on the inside. I'm gonna have to tear all that out, cut into this tunnel. I'm hoping we're not gonna have to cut into this firewall. I'm really starting to feel the pressure, you know, come down to me as this, suspension comes out that I worked all this time to actually get into the car, get it all hooked up, it's coming out. Coming up, the 392 Crate Hemi gets prepped and ready to be installed in Chris Jacobs 1968 GTX. With its engine compartment already painted with gorgeous artwork by Chris's friend, Mike Lavalli, the ghouls take extra care not to scratch the paint. Did you know that the Dodge Challenger was first introduced in 1959 as the limited edition Dodge Silver Challenger Club Sedan? Kind of a mouthful. Also an interesting point to know is that it was a submodel of the Coronet. As the name implied, the 59 Challenger only came in silver, which is kind of boring, and it only had two engines available, the 230 cubic inch flathead six cylinder getaway and the 326 cubic inch Red Ram V8. The car was marketed to new buyers who wanted the most bang for their buck. So that meant tacking on extra features at no extra cost. And that included premium white wall tires, full wheel covers, electric windshield wipers, upgraded interior, dual arm rests, sun visors, and even deep pile wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Wow. At one point, the Challenger name lapsed and none other than Studebaker came along and introduced their own Challenger in 1964. But eventually Dodge got back in the game in 1969 for the 1970 model year with the Challenger that we know and love today. The 1970 Challenger is often thought of as Dodge's answer to the Mustang and Camaro. It was an E-body like the Cuda, but just a little bigger, two inches longer to be exact. Unlike its 1959 forebearer, the 70 had a lot of options, including almost every engine in the Chrysler lineup. It may have been a late response to the pony cars of the mid 60s, but Dodge seemed to be doing it right pulling out all the stops. The general consensus is that Chrysler positioned the Cuda to compete directly with the likes of the Ford Mustang and the Chevy Camaro, setting up the Challenger as a more luxurious option to compete with the Mercury Cougar and the Pontiac Firebird. All right, so one last fun fact before I'm out of here. In the classic 1971 film, Vanishing Point, its 1970 Challenger RT 440 Magnum is prominently featured. As it happened, five nearly identical Challengers were lent to the film by Chrysler and needed to be returned after filming. Well, spoiler alert, at the end of the film, the Challenger exploded. So this set up a bit of a problem for the filmmakers because even though they were rough on some of the cars, they couldn't give one of the cars back in pieces. So what did they do? They decided to blow up a stand-in car instead. And you know what that stand-in car was? A 1967 Camaro. So even in Vanishing Point, the Challenger managed to win out over another pony car. But we weren't surprised by that because it's Mopar or no car, or blown up car, whatever the case may be. So far, the ghouls have hustled to get Chris Jacobs' 1968 GTX and John Buck's 1971 Challenger completed. But when Mark discovered that John's Challenger wasn't going to make the deadline, work shifted to convert the Tribute Superbird to a hellbird. 
Now, the ghouls race against the clock to build out each K member and install the epic Hellcat and 392 Hemis into both muscle cars. Ronnie! Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> How's it going? You did it, all right. So I'm Ron Jenkins, I'm out here for Magnum Force Racing and I uh, thought I'd give the guys a hand on this new Superbird project that's gonna have a Hellcat motor in it. I got a load of parts, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you have enough for two or three cars. Uh, I do, actually, <laughs> yep, got three cars worth. I love giving them options, you know, everybody likes choice. So I brought a uh, number of other subcomponents that are gonna go with the suspensions as well, like uh, oil pans and uh, just a multitude of different options uh, to help get this project along. Oh, <laughs> there you go, huh? What do you wow, think? Wow, look at there. So Ron brought everything in, got it all laid out. There's some pretty, <laughs> some pretty cool stuff that you brought in. Okay, so what kind, oh wow, look at that. I love it, it's like candy. Yeah. Now so what's, so the pans are different? Yeah. So what's this here then? That The pan has to be shorter. You're saying on the Hellcat, we can't afford this much lip from here to here? Exactly. So they move that hole farther back from the 6'4". And this, you modified this? Yeah, we do that. We got our coil over shock setups, stock ride height spindles, is that true? Yep, yeah. Went ahead and power coated a set of stock spindles. We got a couple pairs of them here. Because I want that Superbird and Jacobs both to ride at the same height. Yeah. What we've got here is uh, the power steering com components. So we're looking at all the return lines and... So this would probably go on, oh, down on this you got, end. Yeah, you got two fittings here. You've got a return and a feed. I see. You your, so you got your high pressure line and your low pressure return line. And of course, to match up to all this wonderful third gen Hemi stuff, we've got wow. serpentine built. Wow, so is that beautiful. That will go on there. I love it. Holy cow. Are you familiar with the battle-worn appearance of things, like with firearms and things like that? So looking at the welds here, you can kind of see the highs and lows are showing there. Oh, it's it still got it the black down in it yeah, in the recess black, area. Exactly. God, it's cool. All your stuff's so cool. Okay, now I'm gonna guess, and I'm a little colorblind, but that looks green to me. It's a beautiful color of uh, very much lime green. <laughs> it probably won't be an exact color match for the bird itself. But, but that's your intention, wasn't it's, it? It's pretty close. Because I know what you're thinking. This is, this is bird, so you're asking me to choose between these two here. Mwah. I don't like it when you do that. <laughs> it makes life just tough. Well, you know I'm not a good decision maker, obviously. Wow. Shall I call Chris and see what he wants? No. You no. know what? Chris is out of the loop. Chris ruined it all. <laughs> so Chris apparently has a problem with fire. He likes to burn stuff to the ground. So since he burned his car to the ground, we decided we'd give him a fire-resistant coating. CJ, my man, you are getting the coolest <laughs> Magnum Force Cross member money can buy. I'm beyond in love. This I cannot wait to put this together. It's gonna be the first Superbird Hellcat on the planet. They've got some mods they've got to do to, you know this, better than anybody, to the Superbird. I was a little late getting that done. I'm gonna have them go ahead and start doing that. But what do you think if you and I start working on modifying the engines? Yeah, let's get, let's get the pans on, let's get the pumps on, all that good stuff. Gonna put the pans on. You doing your dancing, Ron? Where you're from? Time to rock and roll. The e-body convertibles are some of the most collectible cars on the planet today. True or false, in 1970, no matter how much money you have, you could not get a Challenger RT convertible with the high winding, high torquing 340 engine. Now, if you think you know the answer, I would recommend you stay tuned after the break and find out if you're right. All right, ghouls, how did you do? This was a little bit of a tricky one. Could you get a 340 in a 70 Challenger RT model in a convertible? You couldn't. Absolutely could not get that package no matter how much money you had. Now this is interesting. In 1970, the Challenger RT, convertible or hardtop, didn't matter, was not available with the 340 period. Now for those of you that are getting upset out there saying my friend had one, your friend had a 1970 Challenger with a 340, no doubt about that, but it wasn't an RT model. It was the A66 Performance model. Now there's one for you. Now in 1971, for whatever reason, you could not get a Challenger RT convertible with any combination. They dropped the RT from the lineup of the convertibles in 1971. So now you know, there's the answer. Mm. 
Uh, do you foresee any big problems on converting this over? I know it's similar in many ways, but I notice even the oil pan, like we talked about, is different. So you think we're going to have some others? Or? Yeah. Well, I tell you, is what, what seems like is uh, going to be a little hidden surprise is going to be some of the plumbing related to the supercharger. But I doubt we it's anything we won't be able to overcome. All right, gentlemen, let's rotate the engine over and get the oil pan off. All this comes together nicely. We should be able, maybe by the end of the day, if all goes well, get the engine onto the K-member and mocked into the car. Because there's also a multitude of things that the other car we did last year for SEMA, the 392, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things this one has, like the cooler, intercooler, whatever they want to call it for the for the supercharger. Right. And then there's uh, remote reservoirs for that. There's piping and tubing that all have to go underneath the hoods. So and none of this we counted on. So. We'll, uh, we gotta, we gotta get that engine mocked in there and then start putting the pieces where they belong. We are ready for an oil pan. I'm gonna be gone for a few minutes or longer. The guys from Radiator Supply House just brought the radiators for this one and Great. Chris Jacobs. So I'm gonna go make sure they fit, look like they're supposed to. You right. guys, put your oil pan on, and I say start working on your motor mounts, engine mounts, sorry. Cool. Uh, you also have your relocation thing you gotta put on. Okay. Got that too. All right. We're good to go. If you need me, I'll be upstairs asleep. Great. Right. Movie? <laughs> That's Christmas vacation. That's the father-in-law. Uh -huh. If you need me, Clark, I'll be upstairs asleep. <laughs> You guys got the ice box? I'm the ice man. <laughs> Wes, how the heck are you? Good, Mark. Good, good to see good. you. Good to see Eric, you, Mark. right? Yep. We're the boys from Sweet Home. Radiator Supply House. Essentially just do most all the restoration for radiators. So I know you were working with uh, with Dave. We got Jacobs yep. GTX. Yep. He gave you all the dimensions for the radiator mounting? Yes. Yep. Same thing for our Superbird 26 same, inch opening? Same. Yep. Yep. Okay. And that's what you guys have in here? Yep. It fits in whatever you're building thick enough to cool whatever power you put behind it. Okay, let's do it. Let's, uh, cool. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's a good looking setup. Yeah, I'll give that to you. Okay. You oh my gosh, look at that. Wow. That's what they call direct replacement, right? Wow. Boy, that's just fantastic. It looks really nice. You're the <laughs> man. <laughs> that's why you surround yourself with the good stuff right there. Got to put on an oil filter adapter to get the uh, angle correct or the filter will run into the K-member. Well, this is great. So now let's take a look. You've got Jacobs too. Yep. yep. I want to just peek at that real quick. Ooh. Oh, that's cool. Who told you to do that? Oh, Christopher Robin Jacobs. Look at that. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to see you good guys. Good to see Thank you, you too. Hey, this is great. You it's need good. anything else, let us know. Oh, come on out. I'll walk you out. Ron's gonna put on his power steering pump. I just wanna show you something here real quick. The original power steering pump would have bolted into the bosses that are in this cylinder head here. To use his reservoir, this one here, he's built this really cool adapter. That's what this is here. So he's got it already bolted into place and those are the original mounting points for the original power steering pump. Now that will accept this into place. So Ron, you go ahead and put that on. Okay, so right now we're ready to put the new wiring harness on again. Uh, grab that, Dave. Sure. This is their. This is part of their package. Is you have to take that old harness off, put this on because this will talk well and play well with the new controller unit that we're going to install in the car.
So we've gotten to a point where we have the K-member, uh, the Magnum Force K-member installed on the engine. All the pieces are bolted up, the changes, the oil pan, the pickup, all the things that needed to change, they're changed out. So we can flip it over, put it on the stands that we have for it. Then we'll be able to marry the six-speed Tremec to it. And there's quite a few little pieces involved in that as well. But that's the very first thing. After that, we'll be able to put it in the car. So I have cousin Duct Tape and Dave working together on helping Ron marry the transmission uh, together with the Hell Crate. And I think that if Rod Serling were to do a modern day version of the Twilight Zone, he would have these two worlds colliding. It's so cool. You've got the third generation Hell Crate engine married to a six speed aluminum transmission that setting right on the top is the same cherry that was setting on the same pie back in 1970, the legendary pistol grip shifter. What a great fusion of old and new school together. I just love this kind of stuff. We are at a point right now where all the Superbird pieces are completely done and ready to go into the car. So engine transmission, we've done the wiring harness, we did the oil pump, the sump, the different conversion pieces, everything is ready. That's a good point for us to stop because we are on a timeline and while all this is fresh in our head, jump over on Chris Jacobs' drivetrain and get it ready to install. So we're gonna do that next. Let's do this thing. Okay. <laughs> Bottom floor, Hemi. Three. Bottom floor. One. <laughs> Turn I don't off. have my eyeglasses on. We got that, go. got that your glasses on. fitting on this side, so. It looks pretty this. centered so far. Yeah, you're gonna wanna watch that. Uh, Let's see, uh, point of interference. The AN fitting. AN. Army, Navy. <laughs> And Dave is routing a wiring yep. harness that'll go to the controller through the firewall right now. I'm liking the way that the third generation Hemi stuff is bolting in these cars, okay? It's a small block, it's based on a small block, so that gives you the extra room you wouldn't have with like a Hemi by all means, or even a 440. Uh, so it, they go in, they fit nicely, you don't really have too much to worry about in the way of scratching things. And in, in case of Chris Jacobs, that's a really good thing because boy, if we do have a problem with it, it's got some custom artwork done on it and we would be in real big trouble if something were to happen to it. Are you excited working on a celebrity's car? I don't, I don't know what you mean. I mean, I feel like working on my own car. Why would I get excited about working on my own car? Obviously. Okay. How are we looking, gentlemen? Looking good. All right. Okay. Ooh, a little less out Lower down a little more there, old buddy. Yep, barrel yeah. roll. Do a P51. Yeah, that's right. Giddy up. There we go. Let's get down past where we got. You want to pull the dipstick tube out of the transmission for me? Yeah. Perfect. All right. I think we're ready to go down just a little bit more, gentlemen. All right. Wiring is hanging. Stop, please, Doug. Uh, we need oh, to. Oh, you popped that, uh, that strap, strap off, huh? Uh, the front of the key number. I didn't take it off. Oh, I didn't take it off either. It's usually that Maybe we never flat. put it on. Oh, I had it on. Who took the strap off the front? Pretty good. I did. Did you you long off? hair. Did it, and I'm proud of it. Dirty long hair, if I could grow my hair like that. <laughs> Let me see if I can get in here second. Dave would like a moment to, to clear a few things up over there. I noticed that Dave has taken a extra modicum of caution when it comes to installing this engine Chris's car and I can see exactly why. Like I had mentioned earlier, Mike came all the way down from Washington and did this really cool uh, commemorative artwork on it. And so it's not like on the other cars where if you scratch something we just send it over to Will and he touches it up. Will can't do that kind of graphic artwork. So with that I'm just really glad that Dave's taken the extra steps to be really cautious right now. We can't have that setback, he knows it. So again, it's all what makes great teamwork at Graveyard Cars. There. Got it. Okay. Well, I think we're ready to go up. I think we're good, yeah. I think we're good, too. Thumbs to... up, Doug. Thumbs up, car's up. We might as well lower it down. Let's see what that <laughs> looks like in there. Now, look at that. God. Reborn. God, we got room for headers. Wow. Please. Wow. Look at that. That's the way they're supposed to fit. Mm -hmm. Just like that. Boy, that's nice, huh? 
Okay, gentlemen, I am going to cut you loose to bolt everything together. Ron, you have suspension for it. <laughs> and you got yes. all your trickeries. Okay. Uh, we're gonna go work on a Superbird that's about to get a Hellcat. Gato de Hades. Some people call it hell, I call it Hades. So we got the K-member and engine in, got the lower control arms on already, so we're about to put the upper control arms on. As soon as we get that tackled, we'll put on Chris's brakes. He wanted to stay with his brakes that he brought the car in on, and that's one of the cool things about our suspension, is that it allows the inclusion of pre-existing combinations like this. It's actually gonna be a big time saver and a big money saver as well. So while I am the first to admit the week started off pretty scary, yeah, pretty really disappointing, scary. Really scary. George comes in and tells me that the car's not going to make it. He didn't seem too worried about it either, which made me worry a lot for a lot of reasons. Yeah. <laughs> but once I had, and I'm not going to take credit for it, I just happened to be an epiphany, came up with the idea of going to the Superbird yeah. for the tribute that uh, things just really started to kind of break free a little bit and, I, and, I, and it lightened the mood and, and everybody was, uh, I think, kind of a team player and, and ready to go with it. Yeah, so. well, uh, Will was going around the shop telling everybody that he came up with the idea of putting Hellcat in the Super how, 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 what? <laughs> Is that what he said? That's what he said. He, remind, he did his job. I told him to remind me to order the Phoenix graphics stuff. So he comes in my office and you know what it is because they were filming, doing their thing. Yep. It's his chance to showboat, right? That's what yep. this is all about. Anyway. Once that weather changed and we were ready to get going, Jacob's car, now yep. there's a lot of steps, but a lot less steps in that one than there is Superbird. Yeah, way more familiar with that engine. So yeah, no phenomenal job getting it disassembled quickly yep. without breaking anything, that's yeah. good. Mike Lavalle? Yeah, Lavalle. It's good that he showed up. Uh, so overall, I think on Jacob's car, everything went great. There is a lot to get that Superbird together. All the pre-alignment that you can do, all the preparation, all the conversion, all those things. But <laughs> a few things always worry me. Number one is we haven't done that engine. Did you happen to notice that the engine is incredibly tall with the supercharger it on it? It's way tall. It's, it's a it's, different it's, looking footprint yeah. than I thought that it was earlier. I thought that it was kind of an identical twin to the 392. Yeah. Even though I think it's smaller cubic inches, it sure looks bigger. Yeah, and I made the mistake of assuming that it was plumbed the same as the 392 with the upper and lower radiator hoses, and I was wrong about that. So oh. I had to call our friends over at Radiator Supply House and have a new radiator made for it. You told so. them the outlet is on the other side? Yep. Why would they change? Well, they probably the plumbing to get to the supercharger. Exactly. But the good news is that thing's ready to go together, and if everything goes well, get that car put together and ready and make yeah. it to SEMA. Yeah, hopefully. Down to the wire. Down to the wire. Good just, job. Just the way we like it, right? Yep. And what's it just, you guys cut. What was he saying about him doing something? He didn't come up with nothing. I'm no. the guy that came up with everything. You did. Yeah, I did. You came yeah. up with you. I appreciate it. Oh, and I was going to ask you too, uh, how did John Buck take the news of not getting his car to go to SEMA? I haven't done it. <laughs> I don't have a heart. His car isn't going to get done because of SEMA again. But the good news is I'll get him a set of tickets. He should be happy. Probably yeah. buy him a hot dog when I'm down there. Be great.